Hello to the Provo County District Library. I am Mindy McGinnis and I am here to talk to you about my 2015 book, A Madness So Discreet, which won the Edgar Allan Poe Award that year. A Madness So Discreet is a gothic historical thriller that is all about insane asylums, lobotomies, the beginnings of criminal profiling, how they caught criminals back in the 1890s, and it also deals a lot with women's rights and the treatment of the insane during that time period. I'm going to be talking to you a lot specifically about the Athens Lunatic Asylum, which is in uh, Athens, Ohio, and is now serving as part of the campus of Ohio University. So I will talk to you a little bit about that. And afterward, you can feel free to ask any questions for me here in the comments on the Facebook page. I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. I'll be hanging around for about half an hour or so. So I will see you then and feel free to ask me anything after the presentation. Welcome to this presentation about A Madness So Discreet. I am Mindy McGinnis. This is titled Blood, Brains, and My Historical Boyfriend, which will make more sense as we continue on. One of the things that I researched a lot about in order to write this book was lobotomies. So I'm going to talk to you quite a bit about lobotomies here at the beginning of this presentation. I did research for about 18 months before I actually began writing this book. So I will talk to you about some of my research and then share with you some of the books that I read in order to learn a lot of the background information that I used while writing A Madness So Discreet. So one of the first things I'm going to show you here is a surgeon's kit. Now, this is from the 1800s, specifically Civil War era. This is a surgeon's field kit from Civil War times. And while it may not necessarily have some of the tools that would have been used for a lobotomy, it does show you that they were working with some fairly archaic tools and a lot of the methods that they had while they were well-intentioned and certainly the best that they had at the time they weren't necessarily always the cleanest or the most effective so this is an example of what a surgeon would be carrying with them into the field of battle to treat any number of wounds different kinds of injuries and this is what they would have maybe about 10 pieces of equipment and of course having no opportunity to clean them in between patients so lobotomies specifically are a brain I won't even call it an operation because it's not that technical it is simply a procedure where they take what is called a leuctotome, and I will show you what a leuctotome here is in the next slide. But for the moment, what I want you to do, if you could, I want you to take your thumb, and I want you to put it about halfway between your eyeball and your eyebrow. And you can feel a really bony ridge right there. That's your skull, but specifically, that's your orbital lobe. So your eyeballs are resting there inside of your orbital lobe. And if you take your thumb from where you have it right there on your orbital lobe and you hook it back just a little bit, don't press too hard. Once you see double, definitely stop pressing. But if you feel back there, there's really not a lot stopping you from getting up to your brain right there. That is just soft tissue. And a long time ago, like uh, in the early 1860s, people knew that the frontal lobe which is the part of the brain that is directly beneath your forehead right there above your orbital lobe was the part of the brain that housed your personality and your mannerisms and all the things that make you you are in your frontal lobe and they knew about this because of a man named Phineas Gage. The name may be familiar to you, and I will move to the next slide in a moment, but first I want to tell you about Phineas. Phineas was in Connecticut, I believe, and I'm pretty sure he was alive during the 1840s, and he worked on a road crew. He was actually the foreman of a road crew, 
And at that time, that was a very good job for someone who uh, did not have a higher education to be employed at. Phineas was a very hard worker. He was uh, very well liked, very polite, very kind, very understanding. He was the manager of his own crew. And what they were doing at the time was working on roads. And what they would do in order to blow holes in, let's say, like the side of a mountain in order for a track to be laid for a railroad or for a road to go under a bridge or something like that, they would use gunpowder and cause explosions. So their method was that someone would drill a hole in the side of the mountain or in the uh, part of the rock that they're trying to clear away. And then someone would come along and pour gunpowder into that hole. And then yet another person followed behind that person and they had melted wax, like candle wax. And they would pour that on top of that gunpowder. And what that would do, it would form a cap, a little, little plug of dried wax. They'd wait for it to cool. And then the last person would come along with what's called a tamping iron. A tamping iron was about um, three feet long. It weighed about 14 pounds. It was pretty thick if you take your thumb and forefinger and put those together, you get about the size of what a tamping iron would be. So the tamping iron guy would come along and he would tamp that iron down on top of that wax plug in order to get a really hard pack on that gunpowder. And then they would, the last person would come along and run a uh, line down into the gunpowder and set that, set a fire, run a spark down there. Everyone would run away, and essentially they have created a stick of dynamite inside of the rock. There would be an explosion, and then they can keep moving forward. So one day, Phineas was working with his crew, and he was actually performing the tamping iron job. So Phineas was moving along with his tamping iron and driving that down on top of that wax cap in order to create a hard pack with the gunpowder so that you get a better explosion. What happened to Phineas was that the person who was pouring the wax into the hole missed one. And Phineas comes along with his tamping iron, which is three feet long, weighs about 14 pounds. And he drives that tamping iron down into that hole right on top of gunpowder. Causes an explosion. Now Phineas is standing over the hole and the tamping iron more or less turns into a rocket, comes up through his skull. I messed my slides up. We're going to go to the next one. Comes up through his skull. It enters underneath his eyeball, exits the top of his skull, and the entire tamping iron passes through the frontal lobe of Phineas's brain. Phineas doesn't die. In fact, Phineas doesn't even lose consciousness. He is blown off of his feet. He lands about four feet away. His crew runs over and he sits up. And as you can see, there's literally a flap of skull there open for him. He sits up and part of his skull flops forward onto his forehead. And Phineas says, what happened? He has a hole in his face. He has a hole in the side top of his head. Part of his brains are still on the tamping iron, which is laying a few feet away. His crew says, hold on, dude, we're going to take you to the hospital. They put him in a cart with a mule drawing it. Somebody runs and goes get the tamping iron because they think maybe they can put some of his brains back inside of his head at the doctor's. And they show up at the doctor's. Phineas never loses consciousness throughout this entire procedure. They show up at the doctor's and Phineas walks up the steps of his own, uh, under his own cognition and says to the doctor, well, I guess this is enough work for you today. And the doctor is like, yes, yes it is. And so Phineas comes under the care of the local doctor who manages to save his life. Phineas does live through this escapade. His brain swells. What happens often when you have a experience a brain injury during this time is that they would do what is called um, trepanning. I'm going to go back to this kit. Up at the top, you can see uh, something that kind of looks like a wine bottle. That is kind of what a trepanning tool would be. For a trepanning tool, what they would do is that they would take 
um, and they would make a hole in the top of someone's skull. So you can see Finney has already had a nice, like, perfectly made hole for him right there. So the brain could swell. If the brain swells too much, it is a, called a concussion. And the danger that can come from a concussion is that the brain swells so much that it cuts off its own oxygen inside of the skull. People knew this back then, and so they would perform a trepanning, which is where they punch a hole in the skull so the brain can swell, sit outside of the skull, hopefully not become infected. At this point in time, they did not know about germs. And so you would just kind of cross your fingers and hope that you would live long enough for the brain to stop swelling go back inside of your skull, heal this, uh, stitch this closed. And a lot of the times at that point in time, they would take a coin and they would set it in that little hole that they had made with their trepanning tool. And then they would take an egg and they would put an egg white. They would break an egg and put the white on top of that. And they would just let it dry, hold that coin in place long enough for that skull to start healing back closed and to hold that metal coin in place. It was the original metal plate. So this was how they treated head injuries at the time. Now, obviously, Phineas was beyond a head injury. He had a full frontal brain damage, but they didn't know this. All they knew was that physically he had recovered. The doctor begins to notice because Phineas stays with him for months and the doctor is studying him and studying this amazing case of a brain injury. and. He notices that Phineas, and this is his own words, the doctor says, Gage was no longer Gage. His personality had changed entirely. His frontal lobe was destroyed. So his personality, everything that makes you you, that lives here behind your forehead, was smashed, was run through by a four foot long, 13 pound metal bar. Phineas became a drunk. He was also very crude. He would say things to women that you simply didn't say in the 1800s. Uh, he was no longer dependable for work. He had so many different aspects that simply weren't there in his personality from before. Also, he had lost his ability to really use logic. He became um, entranced by stones. Uh, for one thing, he liked to walk along the river and he would gather shiny stones. And he believed that these stones were worth a lot of money, even though they weren't. They were just pretty pebbles, but he had decided that they were. And the doctor did a little experiment one day and he said, Phineas, I'll give you $100 for your favorite rock. And this was in you know the 1800s. I would sell someone a rock today, it's 2021. Well, no, it's not, not yet, I wish. No, it's still 2020, we're still in it. Okay, but he offered Phineas $100 for a stone and Phineas said no, his logic was destroyed. So because of Phineas and because of the doctor that saved his life and then continued to take notes on his condition as he recovered, people knew in the 1800s about the frontal lobe and about how it controlled a lot of elements of our personality and what makes us unique individuals. And this is where the idea for the lobotomy came from. So a lobotomy, I'm gonna take you back, I'm gonna show you a leucotome. This is a leucotome. It is creepy looking. I'm gonna see, I don't think I can, no, I can't zoom. Well, this is a leucotome. And if you take a good look at this, this picture is from the Southeastern Ohio History Museum. It is in Athens, Ohio. And this particular leucotome actually belonged to Dr. Walter Freeman. If you look down into the right hand corner here, you can see that his name is emblazoned on the end. So Dr. Freeman is famous for being one of the world's uh, foremost doctors that really said that a lobotomy is the way to go. Um, he's really remembered as America's lobotomist. So what a lobotomy is, I want you to go back to that idea of where your thumb was earlier, right there on that uh, occipital lobe, I'm sorry, on the uh, orbital lobe. And they would take this leucotome, you can see there's a pointy end right there, and they would slip that right underneath the orbital lobe and then the doctor would quite simply push on the end of this lutetome and jam it up into your brain and then they would swish it back and forth more or less left and right swish it back and forth this was not a particularly delicate surgery 
they just made swishy motions with the leucotone. And the whole idea was that they were cutting some of the nerve paths and some of the synapses that are firing in that frontal lobe. And I'm gonna go back to Phineas here, and you can see um, inside of his skull, the brain there. So a lot of the times when people have any type of mental illness that uh, results in a behavior problem, uh, if you have, ADD, ADHD, depression, anxiety, a lot of these things are caused by too much electrical activity in the frontal lobe of the brain. And they believed during this time that if they could simply cut some of those connectors between the left and right lobes of the brain, that it would alter these, that it would be kind of like a medication for any of these mental illnesses. And uh, technically, this is true, uh, if you take any type of medication for some of the uh, diagnosis that I mentioned before, uh, a lot of what those do is in fact limiting some of the exchange of chemicals and um, electric impulses in your frontal lobe. So that is Phineas and that is Phineas's damage and that is the beginning of brain science as we know it and how people came to understand the frontal lobe and essentially Phineas received the world's first lobotomy he just got it with a tamping iron instead of a leucotome so the other thing that you want to know about Phineas is that during my research about Phineas I found an actual picture of Phineas so it's important for you to know that this is my historical boyfriend this is Phineas Gage this is Phineas after he lost an eye and had a four foot long 13 pound metal uh, tamping iron driven through his face and he's still good looking. That is an accomplishment, my friends. And by the way, that is the actual tamping iron that passed through his head. Phineas kept the tamping iron. He actually made something of a living as a little bit of a freak uh, carrying around his tamping iron and offering people to touch the hole in the top of his skull. If you're interested, Phineas's skull and tamping iron are on display in the Harvard Medical Museum if you wanna see those things. I personally wish I could have seen Phineas in the flesh because he looks pretty good to me. So that's my historical boyfriend. Now, moving on. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about some methods that were used in insane asylums to treat the insane during the 1800s. Now, most of them sound horrible, and in fact, they were. However, they were based in, they came from a place of kindness and healing and ended up becoming something else. So the first thing I wanna to talk to you about is sheet wrapping. You can see here, oh, and all of these pictures are from the Athens Lunatic Asylum in Athens, Ohio. So this particular picture is of a group of nurses that are monitoring patients that are receiving sheet wrapping. So what sheet wrapping is, is essentially you are wrapped from head to toe like a mummy and then they lay you down and you typically, the sheets are warm and then they put a warm compress across your head and it's supposed to keep you calm and still. It's supposed to feel good the way a weighted blanket feels good. That we use weighted blankets today for stress. Or if you think about mothers with young babies, what do you do with an infant in order to make it feel calm? You swaddle it. It's the same idea. There is actually some comfort in that warmth and in that immobility. However, many, many institutions took the sheet wrapping too far and used it as a way of keeping patients immobile. So for example, here we have two women looking over, let's say two, four, six, eight, ten 10 different men and everybody's immobile and this is a really easy job right now. So however, these particular uh, people are being treated in a fairly humane way. Their faces are exposed. They can't move their arms or their legs, but they can breathe. Some facilities would actually wrap you head to toe and only leave you a tiny hole for you to be able to breathe through. And some facilities also left you in that immobilized position for as long as they felt necessary. If they didn't want to deal with you, you stayed there. If you had to go to the bathroom, you did it in your sheet. You were without any type of mobility whatsoever and you were at the mercy of your caregivers and had to hope that they were decent people. 
Next, I want to talk to you about hydrotherapy containment baths. This is a treatment that you see often in any type of horror movie, TV shows, things where they show old asylums, you always see the hydrotherapy rooms with the clawfoot tubs. The idea here was that many doctors believe that if you had a mental illness, it was because your brain was too hot or too cold. It kind of depends what kind of school you went to, but hot was the idea. So they believed that your brain was too hot and lowering your body temperature would help alleviate your mental illness. That's completely untrue. However, that was the basis for the beginnings of the hydrotherapy containment baths, where as you can see, these people would be fully stuck inside of these tubs. And uh, usually they are filled with ice water these people are not able to get out and they are just laying in very, very cold water. Now, again, that sounds horrible and it is. However, it is. today people pay to sit in sensory deprivation chambers where you cannot see or uh, hear anything and you are simply floating in water. And that is a highly meditative state that does in fact calm your brain and your body. So there were some good ideas here with the hydrotherapy containment baths, but again, they could leave you in there for as long as they wanted. They could get your water as hot or as cold as they wanted. So institutions that weren't too worried about quality of care could abuse this treatment fairly often. This, to me, is the worst possible one. This is called the spinning chair. So the original concept of the spinning chair was based on the idea that the body is made up of four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. We know that's not true. However, one of the earliest doctors in recorded history really stuck to this idea and some uh, doctors in the past still held on to that concept, even though they knew it simply wasn't true. But one of the ideas regarding mental illness was that if you had any sort of problems in your mind, it was because your humors were mixing too much. Your blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm were mixing, and you needed to basically be spun out so that you, in a centrifugal motion, so that your blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm would be able to separate and go to their own spots inside of your body. Now, that's not true. We know that. However, this idea of the spinning chair persisted as late as 1936. This photo here with this gentleman strapped into a spinning chair was taken in 1936. Next, I want to show you this. This is an incontinence ward. This is from Philadelphia. This picture was taken in 1945. Incontinence, of course, means that you are unable to control your bladder or your bowels. And I do not have a lot of background for this picture. I found it while I was doing my research, and so I did make some assumptions about what we're looking at here. But it is 1945. This is post-World War II. We are seeing young men here that are able-bodied, and by that I mean they have all of their limbs. There doesn't seem to be something particularly wrong with them physically, yet they're in an incontinence ward. More than likely, I would imagine that some of these fellows have, uh, well, they would have called it shell shock in 1945, but I am willing to bet that some of these guys have PTSD. They're in the war, they came home, they're simply unable to cope and have incontinence is part of their PTSD. Uh, you can see they're not wearing any clothes and that's because they're going to pee in their clothes and no one wants to clean their clothes repeatedly. They're also in a room with no furniture and that is for the same reason. No one wants to clean their furniture because they cannot hold their urine long enough to be trusted around furniture. They are in a concrete room with a grate underneath them so that they can pee whenever they need to, not have any clothes, not have any furniture, and just basically not cause anyone any inconvenience. And again, this is 1945. This was 60 years ago. And I also want to point out massive HIPAA violation. These guys don't want their pictures taken. They are in an insane asylum, unable to hold their bells or their bladders, and people are walking through taking pictures of them naked and humiliated. So, as you can see, it was not awesome to be in an insane asylum, even 
as recently as 1945. So whenever I do this presentation, people are always shocked and upset about some of the treatment of the insane, but there's always that feeling that, well, but that wouldn't have happened to me even back then. I'm not insane. Well, guess what? You might have been. This is a list of reasons for admission to the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in the 1800s. So this is in West Virginia. And this is just a sample of reasons pulled from this list. Jealousy and religion. I'm not sure exactly how those two things work together, but I'm familiar with jealousy. And I've certainly known plenty of people that were very inflamed about their religion. You could end up in the insane asylum for being a zealot. You could end up in the insane asylum for being a crazy ex-girlfriend. Laziness. If you were not contributing to society, if you weren't working, if you weren't doing something to promote your own existence, you could end up in the insane asylum. Novel reading. If you read too much, that meant that you were escaping reality. If you were always with your nose in a book, you could end up in the insane asylum. Nymphomania, that's sex addiction. And while that may sound like a good enough reason to end up in the insane asylum, if you were a female, just having an interest in sex could get you labeled a nymphomaniac. If you were just like, you know what? I don't mind that so much you can end up in the insane asylum. An opium habit, addiction. Addicts ended up in the insane asylum. There's nothing wrong with their brains. There's nothing wrong with them in terms of a mental illness. They have an addiction and they could end up in the lunatic asylum. Asthma, you could have asthma and go to the insane asylum simply because your family was not able to care for you. They were not, they did not have the ability Everyone's working all the time trying to keep stuff together. They can't take care of you. If you have an asthma attack, you could go to the insane asylum. Bad company, if your mom doesn't like your friends, or if you're one of the friends that's getting someone else in trouble, your mom could say, hey, that guy is a bad influence and you can end up in the insane asylum. Bad habits, do you chew your nails? Do you pick your nose? Do you not, are you not able to stop doing that sometimes? It's called a habit. And if it's considered really bad, you could go to the insane asylum. Political excitement, I think I can really not say a whole lot about that at this point. Bad whiskey, again, if you are an alcoholic, you could go to the insane asylum. Egotism, if you had a very, very high opinion of yourself for no reason whatsoever, you could go to the insane asylum. Epilepsy, do you have seizures? Same idea as asthma. Your family cannot take care of you. You're gonna go live in an insane asylum because there is on-call medical staff there 24 seven. Syphilis, if you had an STD, you went to the insane asylum. They did not have antibiotics yet and they do not want you spreading STDs among the healthy population. So you go to the insane asylum and how they treated syphilis in the 1800s? Mercury baths, yes you would take a bath in liquid mercury. It took care of your syphilis, but it also killed you. Suppression of menses, ladies, that's birth control. If you were practicing birth control, that's insane. You're a woman, your job is to have a baby. If you don't wanna do that, you're crazy. Go to the insane asylum. The war, again, PTSD. If you went to war and couldn't come back and slide back into your role as a regular human being, you're going to the insane asylum. Time of life, if you are having a midlife crisis, empty nest, whatever it may be, you can go to the insane asylum. Uterine derangement, ladies, if you're crazy, it's because you have a uterus. As soon as you go in, they take it out. It doesn't matter if you're eight or 80. You walk in that door, they're gonna take out your uterus. Also, that way you can't get pregnant and make more crazy people. And lastly, my favorite, Seduction and disappointment. I don't know what this means, but I'm guessing it's a broken heart. I am guessing that this is a breakup gone bad that someone just couldn't recover from and they ended up in the insane asylum. So again, all of these things sound horrible. This is the downer part of the presentation. And now I wanna to talk to you about some positive things specifically the Athens Lunatic Asylum. It is still standing. It is now part of the Ohio University campus. If you look here at the front of the building to the left, 
of the entryway that is now a little cafe and the main part of the building here is actually an art museum that you can go in and you can see the original floors and uh, woodwork there and art on display from students there at Ohio University. The Athens Lunatic Asylum was in operation from 1864 straight up to 1997. And that is operating out of that building right up until 1997. Technically, it's still operating. It has a different name and operates out of an actual hospital. However, this building is no longer in use. You can see there is a beautiful fountain out front there. That fountain is still there. It is in pieces in the back. And I do have a Pinterest page with pictures from my visit to the Athens Insane Asylum, and I will post a link to that in the Facebook chat. If you look to the right, um, to the left side, that would be the men's ward. On the right hand side is the women's ward. The Athens Lunatic Asylum is laid out according to the Kirkbride plan. And the way that Kirkbride designed his insane asylums was that he believed that the ill needed to have plenty of natural light, plenty of access to the outdoors and nature, and large open spaces were good for mental health. Now, something else that I want to tell you is that oftentimes people that worked at the insane asylum also lived there or at least they would live there during their long stretches of days they might work four days on three days off and so they would live in the insane asylum during those times so the center part of the asylum there actually housed the staff that was on call and the women's wards and the men were men's wards that flank the sides the closer parts so the, the wards that are actually touching the center part there would have the calmer patients. And as you move further out is where you get the more deranged and quite frankly louder and hysterical patients are in the further wings so that the staff that is off duty can get some sleep. Today, the women's ward, which as I said is the right hand side, is mostly falling apart. Uh, it, in fact, is probably very close to being in danger of being torn down because of uh, excessive damage to it. The left side, the men's ward, currently serves as offices for the art department of Ohio University. So this is a picture of the asylum grounds. Now, the lake is no longer there. However, if you look, you can see that according to the Kirkbride method, there this was a lovely place to be. They had a, a lake. They had their own farms. They had forests. They had a huge um, root cellar set up. Uh, basically, the asylum was kind of made to be self-sufficient and the patients were given jobs within their skill sets so that they would cook or they would clean or they would farm or they would harvest or they would do things on the grounds in order to keep the asylum moving forward so again most of this no longer exists the building itself which you can see uh laid out here is is still in existence but the the forest the farm the lake those no longer exist this is a picture of the ballroom this picture was taken in 1893 beautiful room it no longer exists as well um, a there's basically been separated into two different floors so that it can be used for uh, the art gallery I believe but as you can see this was a beautiful place um, you can see women women are, are working around here there's a woman uh, taking a piano lesson these are patients these are inmates as they would be called that are living here inside of the asylum but they have a beautiful place and they have a huge room with light and they have duties and they have work and they have things that they can be doing one of the things that they did with the patients was looming, especially the women. They had a lot of uh, tactile tact work that they could be doing. So this is a loom that was used at the Cambridge State Hospital and again in Athens as part of the occupational therapy program. And again, this picture is taken from a display that was at the Southeastern Ohio History Center. So this loom was used by women and I believe there are looms in this picture here as well for the patients so that they could be productive and do something with their time. Um, I also love this particular picture. 
which shows the caring qualities of the staff at the Athens Lunatic Asylum. This is a brochure from their 4th of July picnic, and I don't have a year on this. However, they did do this annually, and you can see they basically have a field day set up with foot races for the patients, and the staff would interact with them, and, and it really was a family type of atmosphere. When I was attempting to get access to some parts of the building that are no longer available to the public, which I was not able to get, but I spoke to a woman at the Ohio University campus whose mother had been a nurse at the universe at the insane asylum and she spoke to me for a while and told me that her mother had patients that were particularly close to her personally and for christmas or thanksgiving she would actually bring them home so that they could have a family meal in a home instead of in the insane asylum and so it just goes to show again athens has a bad reputation especially this time of year it makes all of these top 10 haunted places type of things but in reality if you were crazy this was a good place to be again public interaction this is the lake in front of the insane asylum and these to the best of my knowledge these are not patients and staff these are townspeople, townspeople that have come up to the lake in the winter to go ice skating. The asylum was not a place that was avoided. It was not a place that was thought to be scary or frightening. In fact, it was a beautiful place. And the townspeople would come up and walk in their woods and skate on their pond and interact up in that area because it was known as being a beautiful place and not a place of horror. Uh, to further push forward that idea, this is the female ward. This picture was taken in 1893. These women have their own rooms and most of them were not locked. And you can see that there's a gentleman down in the right hand corner visiting with someone. They could have patients. This looks more like a hotel than an insane asylum, but this is in fact the female ward. Truth is stranger than fiction. Remember the beautiful fountain that I showed you at the beginning? It had a crocodile living in it. And this is a true story. A nurse traveled to Florida and his children, and I believe this was in the 1970s, his children caught two baby alligators, brought them home. One of them passed and didn't make it on the, the uh, trip home, but the other one did. And what seemed like a great idea, hey, I'm gonna capture a baby alligator in Florida, in Ohio was not such an awesome idea. The nurse didn't really know what to do with it. He ended up putting it in the fountain in front of the insane asylum where it lived. And as you can see, grew to be an adult. They would let, he was named Jim Crocky, and they would let Jim hang out and play in the fountain during the spring and summer. People would come up from town to see Jim Crocky. He was very well fed. He never attacked anyone. In the fall and winter, they would take Jim into the boiler room where he hung out underneath the pipes and stayed warm and wet down there. So Jim Crocky, when the establishment finally decided they could no longer have a crocodile wandering free on the grounds, actually was taken in by the Columbus Zoo. Now, I do not have any hard data on this, but I know that uh, crocodiles can live for a very long time. It's quite possible that one of the crocodiles at the Columbus Zoo is actually Jim Crocky, but I don't know that for sure. It's something I'm still trying to chase down. I did actually write Jim Crocky into my novel, even though the novel takes place in the 1890s. It was simply too great of a story to ignore. I love the idea of an insane asylum inmate telling someone there's a crocodile in the fountain and everyone thinking that they're just crazy, but no, there is. There's a crocodile in the fountain. Okay. So um, I have a trailer here for my book that I'm gonna play for you. They all had their terrors. The new girl believed that spiders lived in her veins. Her screams sliced through the darkness 
passing through the thin walls of Grace's cell and filling her brain with another's misery to add to the pressures of her own. The new girl hadn't learned yet that screaming didn't bring help. Quite the opposite. They all had their terrors, but at least the spiders that lived in the new girl's veins were imaginary. Grace had learned long ago that the true horrors of this world were other people. Alrighty, so I'm going to show you some of the books that I read in order to do my research. I'll just go through real quickly. The first one up here on the top left is called Madness, A Brief History by Roy Porter. The second one there, I know it's not very easy to read. It is called The Lobotomist. And it is by Jack L. High. It is actually a biography of Walter Freeman, who, as I said before, was the America's first prominent lobotomist um, and he has been somewhat demonized because he continued to practice lobotomies um, when it was really no longer practically to be doing it however he did this because he really believed that he was helping his patients he was not a crazy doctor shoving ice picks into people's faces he really did believe that he was helping the mentally ill and made it his life mission to do so the next book you see there is titled My Lobotomy. It is a memoir written by a man named Howard Dully, who was lobotomized as a child. His mother had died, his dad remarried, his stepmother did not like him, and arranged for him to receive a lobotomy. He had ADHD. We did not know what that was when Howard was a child. And Dr. Freeman actually performed Dully's lobotomy. That is a very interesting book, My Lobotomy by Howard Dully. The next book there, the last one on the right at the top, is called Women of the Asylum. And that is a collection of letters written home by women who are in the asylum. And especially women did not have rights. And you could end up in the insane asylum and have absolutely nothing wrong with you. Down there on the bottom, Phineas Gage, a gruesome and true story about brain science. That is by John Fleischman. Uh, it is actually a book that is written for uh, high schoolers and junior high kids. I find personally when I am doing my research, if there is a topic I don't know much about, let's say brain science, instead of reading a book about brain science written for adults that I might not know enough about in order to really fully comprehend it, I try to find a book written for kids that has things broken down, complicated topics, made easy. The next book was highly useful. It is called Asylum on the Hill by Catherine Ziff. It is specifically about the Athens Insane Asylum and the history of that particular building. If you are really interested in trepanning the practice of punching a hole in the skull, you can read A History of the Practice of Trepanning of the Skull by Robert Miners. And this is a collection of doctor's notes from the 1800s. And uh, while it was useful to me, I certainly wouldn't recommend reading it unless you're super curious about skulls with holes in them. Um, real quick, I'm gonna tell you a few things about my other books. Uh, my first two books are Not a Drop to Drink and In a Handful of Dust. Those are post-apocalyptic stories set in a world with very little water to drink. We call this Little House on the Prairie on crack. Don't do crack, but read these books. I have a book called The Female of the Species. This is a rape, revenge, vigilante justice story. It's all about a young girl whose older sister is raped and murdered. It happens in a very small town. Everyone knows who did it, but they don't have the evidence to convict. So the guy walks. The little sister is not okay with that, so she kills him. And that's the first chapter. I also have a high fantasy series. If you like fantasy, you will like these books. If you don't like fantasy, you won't like them. If you want to give them a shot, I call these books Game of Thrones with less raping and no dragons. But I promise you there's still a plot. All right, a psychological thriller, This Darkness Mine. This book is about a young girl, a senior, who's very type A, never does anything wrong. First chair, clarinet, valedictorian, she has everything figured out until suddenly she feels the urges to do quote unquote bad things and she can't figure out why. 
she finds an ultrasound of her mother's from when she was pregnant with her, but there are two babies in there, and she does not have a sibling. She convinces herself that she absorbed her twin in the womb and that she has her twin's heart. Of course, she's the good sister, so the heart of her evil twin must be what is making her act out in these ways. Question is, is she right or is she crazy? I didn't know until I wrote the very last line, so you probably won't either. The opioid epidemic, my uh, 2018 release called Heroin, is all about the opioid epidemic. It features a female athlete, a softball player, who's in a car accident right before her senior year. Her team is expected to go to state. Her best friend, the pitcher, is counting on that exposure to help her get college scholarships. My narrator has to go through horrible surgery and recovery and really relies on her Oxycontin to get her through so that she can be ready to play in the spring. Runs out of Oxy, relies on street drugs to keep her moving. It's a sympathetic look at the opioid epidemic. My most recent book, Be Not Far From Me. I pitch this as drunk hatchet with a girl. It's all about my main character who ends up lost in the Smoky Mountains. All she has is what is on her back and she's out there for over two weeks. So if you're into survival stories, be not far from me. Next year, 2021, let's hope we make it. February 23rd, my newest book will be coming out. It is called The Initial Insult. I pitch this as Tiger King meets Edgar Allan Poe. And yes, I mean that. I took the elements of a few different uh, Edgar Allan Poe short stories for this particular book. It is Cask of Amontillado, The Black Cat, and Mask of the Red Death. And I set them in a small town. It all revolves all it all revolves around a unsolved murder from 10 years earlier and a girl who's determined to find the answers and thinks she can find them by slowly breaking up her ex-best friend in a wall. I referred to this in my head for a long time as Appalachian Allan Poe. In the meantime, one of the girls who lives on what we would have called in my time a white trash zoo, what we call now an exotic animal breeder, is in the area and the panther has gotten loose. So while everyone is attending a drunk party at an abandoned farmhouse, a girl is bricking up her best friend in the basement and a panther is wandering around. So lots of different things can happen there that releases february 23rd there is a sequel that will be out in 2022 titled the last laugh that's it for me these are all my social medias i will be online here in the facebook comments to interact please any questions that you have anything at all i will answer just about anything and i am here to talk about a madness so discreet writing in general treatment of the insane anything i brought up here or any of my other books thank you so much and i look forward to chatting with you